Ann Kemp, and I am the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. I'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the Data Diversity webinar series, Big Changes in Data Modeling, moderated by Karen Lopez. Today, Karen will be discussing modeling metadata with guest speaker Ian Rollins. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting by the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling. Karen is probably one of the most active Twitter dealer Twitters. Um, there at Data Chick. You can always find her there. Um, as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slide of the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce today's guest speaker, Ian Rollins. Many of you are familiar with Ian as we invite him often to speak in data versus City webinars and conferences, but let me give a quick introduction. As Vice President of Product Management, Ian is responsible for the Enterprise and Application Management Metadata Repositories, ASG Rosade, and ASG Manager Products, and ASG um, BQIC, and other strategic solutions. He manages product launch and delivery plans, and creation and management of partner relationships. He was previously VP of Metadata Development, and Ian has many years of experience in application design and development, and has managed a DABAS, IDMS, and D2 databases and design systems to run on a variety of hardware and operating systems. Originally from the UK, Ian is a chartered, uh, chartered IT professional and standing member of the British Computer Society. And like Karen, he also blogs for Dataversity. As many of you know, our esteemed moderator, Karen Lopez, Karen is a senior project manager and architect at InfoVisors. She has 20 plus years of experience in project and data management on large multi project programs. Karen specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP specializing in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. And if you meet Karen in person and learn more from her, she'll be giving a couple half-day workshops at Enterprise Data Diversity in Chicago. The first one will be on driving development projects with enterprise data models, and the second one on new modeling challenges, big data, Hadoop, NoSQL, and the cloud. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, thanks. You always do that so well. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for attending, including my guest panelists, but as all of you, you out there who are logged in now because I also consider you panelists as well. So make sure that your questions put into the Q&A and that you can have discussions on chat as well, but it's easier for us to see the questions in the Q&A. Um, and we'll take those throughout, so no point in saving them up to the end. Um, I heard that you were, you mentioned in the pre-show that you were traveling. Where are you located? What part of the world are you today? I'm in, in a hotel outside Heathrow uh, this evening. Uh, thing that uh, U.S. Airways will get me home tomorrow. <laughs> there you go. So I'm today. I'm in Charlotte, um, and I'm supposed to be trusting that Air Canada will get me home tonight. So uh, last time I tried to get home from here, it took me three nine hours. So we'll see. <laughs> so excellent. So we have a bit of slides today. Uh, for those of you who have attended a few of these, you know there's not always slides. Uh, I've just thrown together a few slides with some terminology of things to help guide some of the conversation. Um, you know, one of the things about this topic is meta and data modeling. Like we use the term metadata as we're doing traditional conceptual and physical data models. Ian's going to tell us that there's a lot more to it than just the definitions that we put around entities and tables. Um, we have a poll. We don't have one set up. Um, but if you are a data architect or data modeler or developer or DBA or anything, you could set in the chat just so you can say hi to all of us so that we deal for it out there. And I wanted to focus on the terminology and foundations and thoughts around metadata data, what that might mean, some of the myths and gotchas, and also question and answers that we have from attendees. I'd also hear in the chat and the Q&A any specific topics related to metadata that you 
like for us to chat about. So I want to see those coming down. There is the standard question of, will you get a copy of the presentation? Yes, you'll get a copy of the presentation because Shannon's excellent of sending these out early next week along with notes and any links that we mention and probably also a link to promote the data diversity education seminars that I'm doing in Chicago that, that Shannon talks about. And one of the things that she didn't mention is the reason I love that event is all the sessions are half day sessions or more. So they're not one hour quick slide deck things, but they're in depth, um, a lot of uh, workshop quality sessions, not just someone reading you a PowerPoint, plus a lot of excellent speakers. Uh, things that I always like to do in uh, in the webinars now and, and in my presentations is talk about what the expected outcomes of the time we're going to spend together. And I always like to talk about them in terms of the interrogative, so very much as Ackman influence, of who, when, where, why, and how, and how much related to this topic. And, and to frame that, because this is a big challenge in data modeling along that space. So, so here's your slide post of some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, and I'd like to start as a good data modeler with terminology and some thoughts around them. These are some of the words that I hear when I talk or research about the data. Um, the first one is my normal complaint is how do we spell it? So Ian, do you have a preference on how we spell metadata? Uh, you know, there's um, so there that claims to have patented the term metadata as you have it at the top here, M-E-D-A-T-A, -A, okay. without spaces or hyphens. Um, mm -hmm. uh, research that dug into a, a lot. It really stand up. I'm happy with the way you have it at the top here. M E T A D E T A. No space, no hyphens, no extraneous punctuation. Uh, if anyone wants to do it differently, um, I don't get that, that much. I, I, you know, I, I'm not not a bigot about that particular item. I, I'm a bigot about some other items. We might get to to some of them, but that one, yeah, I put the one at the top. It's the simplest, but I'm not going to start a religious war about it. Yeah, yeah I'm not either. And actually, this kind of follows the flow of the life cycle of most compound words. They start out being two words, like metadata, and then they hyphenated, and then eventually they, they get adopted and they become one compound word. We actually went through the same thing for those of us that are experienced, like Ian and me. We went through the same thing with database, right? So we had the base as two words and then hyphenated. And then I would say almost universally, except in some academic publications, we'll see it all as a compound word. And then my pick on that is before we had Enterprise Data World, it was two conferences together, and one of them was the Metadata Forum. So if any of you guys out there remember that, that it was the International Symposium and the Metadata Forum. And there was always that question about how we spell it so that we promote it consistently. Um, typically, so now that we've got that, Administria out of the way, and we've agreed. Wait, that. wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this whole thing then, so Excellent. people will know that we, we do. We haven't really scripted this like a reality TV show. This really is interactive <laughs> and real time stuff. Um, here's what's interesting though about what you just said. The reason it was two separate words at the beginning, and it was saying the database, is because somebody was making a conscious statement about what they're talking about the data was somehow something that extended and said something about the nature of data um, mm -hmm. as you know, some kind of high foot and intellectual idea about you know meta was the Greek sort of term for doing that over time one of the things that's happened is people have got confused about what the term means and, and that, that sort of happens as the original kind of spell into typography goes away. So one thing I, I, I kind of want to nail to the mast, if I can, is, is what I think metadata is. And um, I have a very, very loose statement of what I think metadata is. Metadata is all the other stuff that you need to know to make information assets useful. 
let's kind of throw that out there because if I any say data about data again, I'm going to mock and beat them on the head with a wet wet lettuce. Exactly. And I see that in a moment because I went to the intertubes and and at the interweb what the definition was. So we'll see that in a second. Um, and definitely something I want to talk about when we get to that. Um, some of the other things that come up as you search or read or have a book on these topics, it, you tend to run across, you know, that there are glossaries involved and that there's a data workflow and that a repository is involved. And we were, we're concerned about data formats as a type of data, metadata, that we manage metadata for compliance regulatory reasons. Um, and that we might have tools that do metadata extraction. Um, and I love all of these technical terms that have the word extraction because it sounds so violent or um, forceful. It's a, it's a sort of interesting term. Um, we usually work about data life cycles and, and data lineage is the key thing about sort of traceability of data is how I learned it. And a lot of people just talk about source to target mapping, but I think it's more than just mapping of those things. Um, data lineage is a is a big discussion, but no, it, it's kind of cool that you've got a taxonomy of, or you've got a bunch of terms there that could be united into some kind of taxonomy. Because some things you've got in here are, are about uh, the, the data and metadata processes, so life cycle mm -hmm. and lineage and and, and extraction. By the way, I think metadata extraction is a great uh, to that particular aspect because it is like pulling teeth, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, and you've got things on here that are sort of um, related to use cases like compliance and regulator and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got things that, or you've got one thing at least that pulls out uh, the semantic aspect because glory is more about semantics and perhaps more about the, the business um, acts of metadata and less about the structural and technical aspect. And I think as we get into a discussion about the modeling of metadata, we want to talk about the fact that um, it's um, understanding that it goes from uh, highest conceptual uh, business level down to uh, the deepest and most technical um, kind of level. Um, we also need to address the fact that um, the range of assets being dealt with is very broad. Um, you know, I, I was kind of um, appreciative of the fact that, that you, Karen, are on the uh, the, the Ackman board because uh, you know, one of the great things the Ackman framework does is it actually does a really good job of drawing out those different aspects, um, the distinct levels of detail, um, and mm -hmm. you almost take this bunch of terms and put them at appropriate levels and inappropriate cells as some kind of framework. And actually, as you think about modeling metadata, that's a good architectural perspective. Mm -hmm. So, so we, you know, we've got somebody who's be whining about, or oh, sorry, complaining about the fact that we're over-egging this particular cake, so I guess we need to move on. <laughs> um, one of the things, I, so I'm just going to make sure I'm clear here. When you propose a taxonomy of metadata terms, I'm pretty sure you just posed, posed metadata, didn't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> and then we had a taxonomy of those terms, wouldn't we? Well, no interest, um, right? Actually, there is and there isn't. Um, Okay. It actually goes to one of the few formalized approaches to um, modeling metadata, which is the, the one articulated by the object management group um, in the, the meta object facility. And it has exactly that notion of, so there's, there's real things, um, data like, and then there's the model of real things, um, which is metadata. Mm -hmm. And there's the model of the model, which is uh, the, yeah. uh, the meta model. Um, and in principle, it feels like you could go on in infinitum, but in fact, once you get to about the third level, uh, it'd be self-defining, and we don't need to go any further than that. But yes, it's worth understanding that um, if you want to be remodel-driven, um, understanding the, the idea of meta-model is a really good one. 
Excellent. So one of the reasons, though, that I wanted to set a definition for this term is I think there's a lot of confusion of um, just what the, the number one thing that I've kind of got listed later is that something like all the stuff you put in data model using commercially available data modeling tools finds the full extent of all the metadata we'd ever need to collect, manage, or control. So how do you feel about that? Hmm. So, um, there's be no way to ever know what all the metadata you would ever um, be useful is. It's hard to predict that in advance. Um, it's extraordinary how many people collect far more metadata than they can ever usefully use. Finally, um, mm -hmm. I think because what happens is um, we collect metadata, we figure out use cases. We don't start with defining use cases up front and then decide what model needs to look like and how we need to populate the model to support those use cases. Um, mm -hmm. Too often, it, it's kind of thought of as a as a generic keeping type of exercise. Um, yeah. because it's just too challenging to try and speculate about what the useful uses might be. Uh, an argument there for for being able to be fairly agile and, and go back and uh, add new item types and add new uh, new attributes and things like that on the fly or relatively relatively simply um, because things change all the time and you don't know what you know. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with the first question of what you mean by metadata and you did come up with a definition. Can you repeat that again because someone else is asked for it again. Yeah, my definition is a, is a very simplistic one. It's, it's all the information that you need to make your information as it's useful. Okay, excellent. The things I've pulled here, like I said, I asked Google for a definition of metadata, knowing that I would probably get data about data because that's a literal interpretation of that term. Um, the, maybe the denotation of it. And the things that I like about when you search for definitions in, in some services is they give you sort of the um, the occurrences of that and how it appeared over time. And you can see from here that this is a relatively recent term and it's a nice discussion on how it came about in Wikipedia. So I'll put a big asterisk on that because I don't use Wikipedia for research, but it's a good way for starting out things. And the reason I bring this up is that I've tried to do metadata work on some projects and there's a resistance because it sounds like a word that the business terms would never use, the business people would never use. And the one exception to that these days, even though it's been around for decades, is that a lot in the news that over the last couple of years about metadata due to the NSA surveillance and governmental surveillance, not in the U.S., but around the world. And I think that's both a good thing for those of us in the data architecture world because it's now making people think about metadata as something that impacts them directly. It's not just a database term just a design function, that it, it actually is of information as well. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think there's a much more practical or um, close um, use case. Uh, I'm a big fan of iTunes. And you know, you pop a screen that shows you the 17,453 tunes that you've got that you never play. All the stuff there is actually metadata about the digital asset that represents your music. Um, and, and, I, and it's I funny, your iPhone, your folder is actually called metadata. So I popped that up and I told the people I was dealing with with the standards body that, well, the young people know what metadata is. <laughs> and maybe you should too. <laughs> oh, that's a low blow. Um, I was. But, but do you think that... Uh, People use metadata a lot, but it's still right to say that the M word itself is somewhat intimidating. And actually, mm -hmm. I, I encourage 
people not not to use it if they can wave from it. Yeah. Uh, other things that we've noticed about successful and sustainable uh, metadata management projects, they're usually branded with some friendly kind of uh, name, it's different from the metadata repository. So a lot of them are called things like ME and EMA for Enterprise Metadata Management, and they're kind of yeah. friendly, you know. You want to use the information? <laughs> Yeah, excellent. So one of the other things about so what about it is that so that what's the difference between just um what do you mean between the difference of data management and modeling metadata? So do data models about the business or about databases? The distinction between just sort of managing the metadata to do those functions and modeling the metadata? Or is there a difference? There, there, there very definitely is a difference, and okay. you can almost say it's the same difference qualitatively as the difference between um, mm -hmm. modeling data and data management. In other words, there's a whole collection of functions like collecting, storing, um, managing, um, disposing of, securing, protecting. You know, there's a whole collection of activities around metadata that collectively constitute metadata management, and modeling is on component of um, that meta metadata management. So do you use regulator modeling tools to model metadata? Or do you uh, so I'm, as, as you know, Karen, and, and some people and some people may not. I'm incredibly old. So when I was young, I was very carefully educated in how to do uh, relational modeling and, and all of that good stuff. And and then somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, right, well, we've decided that you're going to be in charge of this new thing called metadata and repositories. And I thought, well, that's cool. And the thing I looked for was the, uh, the modeling. And I thought that there weren't any. And actually, it turns out that um, things like relational modeling or uh, the standardized kind of applications, modeling capabilities that we've used don't really work very well for modeling metadata. Uh, and one of the things I keep, keep hoping is that somebody would come up with some really cool algebra for modeling metadata. But so far, nobody's really done that um, and mm -hmm. that means that to an extent we input some of the, the concepts and disciplines from both uh, class data modeling and from application modeling and from the EA space uh, there's, there's still a influence of this that is artistic and there's a number of reasons for that in, including the fact that uh, the nature of the relationships are actually fundamentally different. Uh, you know, the idea that modeling metadata, um, you're dealing quite often with reflexive and recursive relationships, which yeah. um, have interesting requirements for representation. Yeah, that's a very interesting yeah. point. So, why should an uh, average data architect or developer or DBA isn't this just documentation? Why should we care about it? It's not essential. Um, what do we care about? What? Which question? Metadata and metadata modeling. Um, so I would argue that it's pretty important to be able to model met for exactly the reason that you talked about earlier: the notion of abstract. And yes, indeed, enabling agility. Now, I want to be able to, for instance, pull together metadata that relates to a whole bunch of databases or a whole bunch of uh, logical models. It would be really nice if I had a layer of abstraction that allowed me to define the things. And really one of the things that metadata modeling allows me to do. Uh, so it actually enables me to do things like um, aggregate 
and understand the relationships between um, and predict changes related to um, underlying their assets that I'm managing and modeling. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's important as an enabler. And one thing about modeling, can I just make two, two very quick sure. points? Um, two points about modeling. Um, one is, modeling is always a good discipline because it makes you think about use cases. Um, the other thing is, modeling is always a simplification. If you think about what a model is, it's always a simplified representation of something for a particular purpose. And so, yeah, simplification and use case is essential reasons for modeling. Yeah. So, questions that Eric has asked is, would ontology be a model of metadata? Uh, ontology is... Um, a lot of some of the semantic aspects of metadata. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I wasn't the one that introduced $10 words. Uh, so we have ontologies which, um, please, semantic specialists out there, forgive me for what I'm about to do, but ontologies are essentially descriptions um, of the relationships between the concepts that an organization uses to think about itself. Um, hmm. When we get down to um, the data level, the things that we think about uh, or, or the, the things that we're describing, they behave in different ways. And one of the things I've tried to do recently, because I'm, I'm thinking about how to, to put together uh, the semantic world and the data world in a more structured and disciplined fashion is that the, um, the algebras used in the semantic world and the algebras used in the data world are actually different. And mapping one onto another is an interesting challenge. So ontologies are, are, are an aspect of the, if you like. Mm. Interesting. Okay, what's the next? That was good because that's my next question. So, with a typical IT organization, what roles or positions are usually responsible for and tasked with um, metadata modeling or managing metadata? We're just going to keep talking about both things at the same time, even though they're different things. Um, so, what I see typically is um, two things. Um, Dealers eventually get tied with some part of um, modeling, and enterprise architects or architects in general get touched with some aspects of it. One that is very um, unusual in the organizations that I talk to is that somebody kind of gets um, edited to do meta modeling without having any kind of prior modeling background. Oh. And I think that would be a pretty tricky challenge because, as I said earlier, we import some of the notions from other modeling areas. And so I think it's natural that data modelers and architects are the ones who easily acquire this capability. Hmm. Is that like meta analysts or metadata architects? Like what sort of. Yeah. And those are the, the job titles, um, and I was kind of thinking more about who are the people that tend to end up owning those titles or in those positions um, mm -hmm. than the actual job titles. You're absolutely right. Those are the kind of titles that people get, um, and um, it's an unfortunate title to inherit in a way because you know if you're, <laughs> you're at a party and some at a party and somebody says, "What do you do?" and you say, oh, "Metadata analyst." And of course, eyes over. And, well, now that you work for the NSA at this point, so um, so I guess also, where do these people sit? Are they on the business side of the organization? Are they in IT? If they're in IT, are they in some database, state DA group? Are they in in a architecture group, security group? Where would they norm Where would those responsibilities lie in a typical organization? Actually, it's transitioning. 
uh, to be a pure IT function, and, and you know, you 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 know as well as I do. I think that that this started um, in really three places. You know, it started with uh, people doing data dictionary types of things to put together uh, definitions of, of record outs to make sure that uh, programming was efficient and uh, reliable. Um, and there was a, another thread that started um, with document management and things of that nature. And then there was a thread that started with uh, DBAs and things of that nature. So it tended to be very, very technical. And, and I suppose I should qualify and say, look, I'm talking about the kind of metadata management that goes on in the typical business-centric enterprise. I'm not talking about a library metadata management or geophysical or stuff like that, which has different backgrounds. But the classic kind of uh, business type metadata management started as very, very technical, but interesting um, towards uh, the business um, layer. And it's shifting in that direction because it's being driven by governance and compliance requirements. Can you expand upon that? Because that's more of the why. Why would why would keeping yourself out of jail cause you to worry about metadata? Well, that's a large assumption. What makes you think people want to keep their bosses out of jail? <laughs> um, but but that assuming, assuming that was the case, uh, we're increasingly seeing um, regulatory compliance requirements that tie back to that thing you talked about earlier, which was... Uh, Right, data traceability and lineage and things like that. Um, one of the, the really interesting uh, things that's happened to recently is that as part of the whole uh, set of, uh, of requirements, uh, mm -hmm. one that came along was uh, the uh, compliance requirements for something called risk data aggregation which is, okay, you're a bank, how do you figure out your total exposure to all the various risks that might apply? And there's a really interesting core document that actually explicitly uh, establishes the requirement for metadata management and things like glossaries and um, inventories to support um, that business requirements. It's the first time I think that I've seen uh, those uh, business regulatory documents explicitly call out the need for uh, data management and traceability and things of that nature. They've been there before in an implied fashion, but increasingly it seems regulators are starting to make explicit requirements on very senior management to establish that the data management practice their ability, their governance are as they should be. And so when a, um, an order or compliance regulator um, goes along to a bank and says, okay, um, show us the numbers, show us where you got them from, and prove that the underlying mechanisms uh, are found. And at that point, you've really turned what sounded like a pretty technical issue into absolutely a business issue. And I think, you know, I've told a lot of people if you want to do something as part of your management processes that lean on compliance, audit, regulatory, incarceration is a good to motivate the business to understand how doing this might mitigate their risks of compliance with those things. As we talk a lot about, um, you know, great it's going to be if we only did all these things. Thing, but making it real for the business makes it difficult for the business to want to invest in it. If you can establish uh, for a financial institution that if they do this stuff right, they have more capital available for investment, then you establish a positive business value. Or if you establish that if you do this wrong, you'll go to prison, then you've established a, a fear factor. Um, but, but trying to persuade people to do it because it's just good practice, it's the right thing to do, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And uh, I'm talking to uh, a fairly senior um, executive in a financial institution uh, here in Europe, 
uh, and he said, you know, if we didn't have to do this stuff, there's no way in the world that we would want to do it. Yeah. Nobody wants to do it for fun. Yeah. Um, let's see. Next slide. Transfer questions in the Q and A at the same time. So you get it juggling this. So how how does meta modeling happen? So you referenced my first exposures to metadata management, which was the use of the first occurrences of or usually called repository tools. And what we did was you know you could sell your data models in there. And this was before we had data modeling tool repositories or, or MoMARTs uh, or model managers. And we would put all of our data models in there, and we would also use some um, scrapers or scanners that would go through and scan through all of our databases and copy books and file outs. I can't remember all the things. And that would pull in all that data, and we would use this use repository product to link everything together. So that was my first exposure to it. Um, and a lot of it was a lot of manual effort uh, trying to link those things together. And then, but we also did some meta um, uh, management, at least through whiteboards and spreadsheets and documents and probably Microsoft Access database. So done now. The, the how is a is a really interesting question. Uh, other way, there's a, there's a very good uh, there is a very good discussion going on in the chat about you know the uh, the challenge of trying to find where a particular piece of data came from and how it got where it got, and say that that could take um, not just hours but weeks and even even months. And that's really the point about this this thing. Um, pretty. Every source of information you deal with has metadata, either explicitly in a catalog or implicitly embedded in itself somehow. And um, one of the things that uh, you're going to do when you're, you're among metadata is try to figure out um, what types of entities are uh, within particular information sources and how they relate to entities entities in other information sources. Uh, and we can kind of describe that at the very loosest, uh, in the loosest way of saying, this is what meta modeling does. Meta modeling um, says there are types of information assets. The type of information assets contain particular types of information, and those types of information relate to types of information in other information assets. Mm -hmm. About that as a, as a kind of abstraction of the process, and remember we're talking about modeling here, so it's always an abstraction and a simplification. Uh, one that you could do, and a lot of people start this way, is you start off with a, um, a sheet and you say, well, I've got these information um, asset types, so I've got databases and models and uh, TL tools and BI tools and so on, and I've got an inventory of, of each class, and in each class, uh, I reference uh, these particular information assets, whether it be you know, rows and columns or logic models or transformation rules and things like that. And uh, I actually manually kind of track the connections. Um, and, and as long as you're really only dealing with a small subset of all the information in, in your enterprise, that's actually a good way to get started. It really gives you a handle on the nature of the problems. So later, though, you're probably going to get some kind of technology like the repositories you talked about. And almost any technology that you get is going to have its language, if you like, to describe things like information assets and the, uh, the types within them and the relationships and things of that nature. And in the end, um, um, a meta model is description of information uh, and and all the tools have that kind of of linguistic description of the information uh, and then that's really what you end up doing uh, whether it be uh, you know ml type tool because it's an omg classification or, or um, 
sort of allergist things up, which tools like the ones that I'm responsible for have, um, something of that nature. But it, it really comes down to that very, very simple idea. You know, we have information classes. The information classes contain information about, info, about uh, item types and the item types of attributes, and uh, there are connections between them. Yeah. I, well, good news. And I think one of the things is, is that I've experienced is that people want the outcome of metadata management, having leveraged some metadata modeling. You know, I'd like to be able to say, okay, on this form, you know, what data comes from, which systems, which integration points, all of those things. Can I find out who the data steward is for that person? Can I find out what legal issues? Are surround that data. Is it HIPAA uh, related? Is it required? Is it personally identifiable information in Canada? Is it personally identifiable information in the US? Because those are separate designations for a data point. Um, they all that. But there's a lot of work in amassing all that data and keeping it up to date. So, how do um, organizations? Even if you went through and established all these relationships, is it something that can maintain? How is that maintained? So that's um, actually an interesting aspect that we are really seeing people start to wrap their arms around now. In most of the major enterprises that we have been working with over the past couple of years or so have started to get very explicit about determining um, what the critical business entities are and um, only really worrying about the detailed metadata management for things which they have deemed for some reason or another to be critical. Now, there's an element of risk involved in that because, you know, as I said earlier, uh, who they don't know. Um, and there is an element of pragmatism to it because the, uh, the sheer volume of information assets that uh, might have to be managed could well be overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. The management has. Sorry, Henry. Not agreeing with you. Peter. Just a, a boast up. One of the things that people don't really grasp is that actually metadata management is a superset of all the applications that you're managing. Yeah. And databases mm -hmm. and should be spreadsheets and Excel documents swing around and learning right. through the monitoring thing, emails, voice voice calls, all of that, right? Yeah, and of course we've we've avoided the elephant in the room so far, but um, big data is coming along, and big data kind of um, sands it in multiple dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, for me, statement on big data and all those things is it doesn't change our fundamental data management requirements, right? It just things that I've thought about is. Now, enterprises are using things that are traditionally associated with big data, like video, like voice, like um, their files and everything. Is that you know those always fit into our traditional relational database management systems, and they don't all fit in our traditional development processes. That in the past made an assumption that that's where enterprise data went, and so at times some of these big data projects and implementations are being done totally outside of our normal processes, our normal data governance. So we start to see um, that they're being managed the same way either, that they're not getting data protection and analysis, that collecting the age of the data and no one's tracing the, the data lineage, can't we, because we point our regular tools to them. Um, and lots of webinars over the last year about you know, data mining and big data, but I think metadata and big data, it's still the same. We still want the same outcome, don't we? We do, but um, one of the things that we're seeing is almost 
um, a visit or what happened with the data warehouse world, you know, and people um, yeah. use data warehouse technologies and, and in it was, was we're just going to do the data warehouse stuff. This is great. We can learn so much that we could never learn before. And then after a while, it, it was why is becoming reliable? Why why are results not what we expected? And it turned out to be the difficulty of impact analysis and change management and things like that as things changed. And it wasn't until people had been doing that for a while that they figured out that they really needed to collect and the metadata because that was how they, they held the whole thing together. Well, I see the same thing happening in the big data world at the moment. You know, per se, saying, uh, you know, we want to do metadata management, we don't want to do governance because uh, we're getting great value out of all of this activity. And you know what? There is this value being got out of a lot of the activity. Uh, there's a bunch of risk built up. Um, mm -hmm. I love what somebody said about uh, metadata. I think somebody said metadata is a love letter to the future. Uh, I've seen and, that picture. I love that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, one, you know, Zachman would say about your status there is that what I would people is you are doing metadata management. You probably just haven't formalized it. So now every single person on your team is doing them separate metadata management. And we could say that about any of data-related disciplines, that you are doing it. You'd be doing it 20 different ways or 50 different ways with no way to really leverage that when you want to integrate data or share understandings about the data across an individual developer. Oh, and the only thing worse than islands of data is islands of metadata. <laughs> Collecting it many times over and over. Yeah, you know, all those things that are challenges. Yeah. What? Okay. Not about mega uh, in the in the big data world is very often um, the big data, uh, the metadata isn't in any sense externalized. You know, you actually have to go and scrape it out of. Uh, things like Pig Latin or HiveQO and things like that, because it, it's not actually because the nature of the environment, it's it's not um, separated out from the data. Yeah, excellent. Um, we're the next question about where. So where do we do? So we've talked a little bit about where we do the metadata modeling and everything, but where do we store and manage all this metadata? I know a lot of people tools and my architecture tool all have a place to put it. I can use my enterprise architecture tool to store some of it, my data link tool. I have speeds sometimes because people have given me requirements that way. I know my DBAs have tools where they're storing metadata. It needs the best tool for whatever we're collecting data about. So, um, that's a very interesting question because the answer has shifted over time. Uh, there was a point where uh, every individual tool had its own manager and there was no rationality between it. Um, then we went to a cycle of um, building big enterprise metadata repositories and populating that and let that be the, the sole and single place in which metadata was supposed to reside. Uh, we are moving, and, and the next thing was a, was a kind of desire for um, some tight federation of multiple metadata stores. Uh, I, I think we're actually heading towards um, a world where there is a central kind of coordinating repository of enterprise metadata, um, but there's also um, loose coupling to a bunch of other metadata stores because legitimate reasons for the various tools to have their own their own doors and to manage them um, in different ways. Um, but I continue to think of the enterprise repository as the uh, you know the, the ring to rule them all to uh, to drop the cliche. Yeah, well, I think it's the same architectural question we have 
for just databases and federating them? And you know, should you put all your data in one on one database server and your data warehouse be the one data warehouse to serve them all? Or do you break them up, up into specialized uses because there, there are benefits there? So I don't know. I have a classic architecture question. It's just a meta architecture question. <laughs> Exactly right, and I can make good arguments in different business cases for um, all love, as it were. Yeah. So in my slide, I just stole one from another presentation. So this is definitely very project oriented, meaning an application development or acquisition or integration project. Um, so typically, we might see data architects, and I'm using that term very broadly. Um, you usually see them come invited to the game very late in the process, like during development and deployment. And I use this slide to talk about you know, how their role for an enterprise architect is right at the beginning of a project and maybe a design slash developer architect coming in slightly after that. But if, if I'm doing a typical IT development project and I wanted to both leverage metadata that we already have and maybe identify and, and collect some new ones, where does that work happen in a typical life cycle of a project? So this is the, the when to use metadata question rather than the, the when to, to model or create it, right? Um, yeah. And this is a pretty waterfall perspective on on stuff. But um, if you take this kind of perspective, then um, metadata uh, at staying through five on this chart. It, it words, all of them. Um, what you use may shift as you move down. Uh, but for instance, project administration, well, you know, all that stuff you've got that's uh, representative of your application portfolio, your project portfolio, that's metadata. Uh, and then you're getting into architecture and, and infrastructure design. You've got enterprise architecture models, and you maybe you've got CMDB, which, by the way, is metadata. just happens to be metadata about infrastructure. Why don't you explain what that is? To people, explain what a CDM is. What CDB? It's a configuration management database. It's yeah. the thing that the service management people use to store information about um, anything that is needed to deliver an IT service. So that could be hardware, software. Uh, it could actually be people. It could be feature. Um, and interesting thing is, if you look at it closely. Uh, what it re what it comes down to is that there are entities which have attributes that need to be related to each other, which is remarkably like uh, what enterprise repository looks like. And really, a configuration management database is the um, the infrastructure analogy to uh, a metadata repository in the information asset world. Um, and one thing that's really interesting is. You could define an enterprise architecture, and you could say, so this is our enterprise architecture. These are our deployment patterns. Now let's go out and look at the, app, the things we've actually got deployed, which were represented in our configuration management database, and see if they actually match. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. I mean, that is whole if we build and manage metadata, uh, just like if we manage data models, like how do we make sure they're kept up to date? and you know, part of the process, they're more likely to be kept up to date and all of that. So we're getting down to just the last five minutes, and I wanted to make sure because I always like talking about this. What are the unicorns myths related to about metadata? Like, so you came across your first one that the definition is data about data. So we'll just get them out of the way. What are the other myths and, uh, about it? Well, you threw out uh, a good one actually, which is. Um, you can do uh, anything with data with actually having metadata. Uh, the idea that you're not matching metadata is a myth. Um, that, that's a good one, I think. Um, 
the idea that it has to be um, difficult and expensive myth. It's really only difficult and expensive if you're applying it to a and difficult challenge. So those are a few. Hmm. You, you want? <laughs> so I think you know, I did mention one early on that business people can't understand the concept of metadata. I think we just have to owe them. And using the analogy of photographs, uh, you know, metadata, because that's what they call it as well, and the thing that come out of the library sciences and uh, document management people, they talk about metadata all the time. Um, I think I can show them, you know, our server people and our operations people track all kinds of metadata. They might not call it that. But they call it, you know, the configuration data or or any of those things. I think it's one of our problems in the IT world and also unforgivable in the data management world since we're supposed to be all about semantics and definitions and having good examples and single definitions of the truth. That we tend to throw these terms around and because this one has you know, the word met in it that people are just sort of struck by the term um, or lousy marketing people to business. It's, I think you can get the business engaged and excited about um, managing these things would would be able to them and don't have to insist that they call it about data. You know, the, the thing is, uh, business to say business people can't understand metadata is to be grossly insulting. Uh, business people understand very well. If there's business value in them understanding. Yeah. The assumption that, that business people should have to understand IT is, to my mind, an ill-founded assumption. They ought to have to understand as much as they need to know to analyze their business functions. Yeah. Um, I think that um, other myth about metadata is uh, related to the fact that you have to do all of it or none of it. Big meta management program and a big repository tool that's highly automated or you shouldn't bother at all and let metadata just sort of be haphazardly managed and collect and use. You're right on. You made the point earlier that everybody is doing metadata management. Um, I touched on the point that a lot of people are starting to uh, run down what they do to the stuff that is regarded as in support of critical business processes. Uh, that is where the truth lies. You should do just as much metadata management Management as you can prove business value for. Yeah, excellent. So down to the last two minutes, and I was just looking at the Q and A and some of the chat. Um, we were looking. I had to ask people the example, a data example of, of standing or or lacking of metadata. Um, Con sort of data free, I like to say, or data problem. Do you have anyone on? The top of your head. Uh, oh, example uh, about data, sort of metadata management or understanding cost and issues. Um, pretty old, but uh, I was in a presentation from a, a telecom organization once at the well, then the DEMA conference, but is now the EW conference, and a gentleman stood up and said, "Well, we we had trouble uh, changing our rate plans far enough because simply couldn't understand." And um, what applications were doing. That was a pretty interesting business justification for metadata management. I thought. And, um, the other, um, the other one is is an organisation that uh, had a misunderstanding of what they're talking about when they were talking about revenue, which is, is the global use case, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. as a result, uh, shifted resources from area of their business to another, much to the detriment of their profits. Yeah, so I think we hear lots of those. And it really does come down to understanding or misusing data that you thought. So I know at the end of the time, but my classic example that I use a lot is that 
people want to use the ISO list of countries as their reference data for their drop down to country because it's managed externally and it's kept up to date. But the problem with that is not understanding that the sure the meaning of that is the current list of countries. So asking a question about where someone was born if the country they were born in longer exists as a country, it's not going to be in that drop down. So that's a not understanding the data. It's a great practice. Use an use your data, but you have to understand its limitations, its timeliness, how long, how much it's updated, where it came from, all of those things. So come to the end of our hour, and boy, that went by really fast, didn't it? I know, Ian, that you have to run, and I've got about ten more minutes that I can hang around, but. Did you have a closing thing? I just want to, of course, thank Ian um, so much for joining us this month. And Karen, thank you as always. And as always, a big shout out and thanks to our attendees who are so engaged in making comments in the chat and getting involved in the conversation with questions and on Twitter. So I hope everyone has a great day. I will stop the recording and I will be sure to get out the links to the recording, the slides, and other things mentioned throughout the webinar today by end of day Monday. You should have that. So if you don't have it in your inbox by Tuesday morning when you walk in, send me an email and I will be sure and get that to you.